Hello everyone and welcome back to Movies with Michael. Today we're going to be talking about the second trilogy of the Middle Earth Saga, which is also directed by Peter Jackson, The Hobbit, and we will be discussing specifically part one of this trilogy, An Unexpected Journey. But before we get to talking about this movie, if you haven't seen my three videos on the Lord of the Rings films, they're up on YouTube right now for all of you to enjoy. So if you haven't seen those, you should go and check those out right now. But without further delay, let's get started. Once again, this is a great use of the prologue sequence, and I think it was the best way to bring the audience back into this vision of Middle-earth with softly letting us know where it is in relation to the Lord of the Rings, while also introducing new characters and a new quest. The movie shows what happened to the Kingdom of Erebor and introduces us to the character of Thorin, played by Richard Armitage. Also, the film doesn't let you see Smaug completely. You see parts of him, which is good so his reveal can be better earned in the next film. So we're back 60 years outside of Bag End. This scene and really a lot of these initial sequences are done very well. Martin Freeman right out of the gate presents this younger Bilbo Baggins perfectly as the comfortable well-to-do hobbit that doesn't want anything to do with anything outside of his status quo. Ian McKellen is back reprising his role as Gandalf the Grey, who is the peculiar and mysterious wanderer who is just an interruption in Mr. Baggins' schedule. The dwarves arriving at Bag End, though altered from the book, gets its job done. It shows that the dwarves will have a good time with teasing Bilbo, but also that they are very serious when they need to be. Having Thorin arrive separately from the other dwarves visually sets him apart and allows Armitage to show the haughtiness of the dwarf leader. Gandalf's fireside conversation with Bilbo sums up what the story is going to be about. A person doing something outside of the norm and becoming someone different, maybe someone greater, because of it. Bilbo listens to the dwarves sing their song, which was a very good way to do it for the film, which conveys the solemn state that these dwarves are in. Bilbo, of course, the next morning leaves to join the dwarves on their quest. The multiple journey sequences in this film echo the few scenes from the Fellowship of the Ring and do a great job at getting the feel that the Hobbit should have. What I mean by this is the journey aspect of the story. It's unfortunate that these films get to a point where it doesn't feel like The Hobbit really anymore, if that makes sense. The roast mutton scene is good. For the way they presented the trolls, they did it well. I also am mostly a fan of that little action scene. The way it happens in the book, I don't think would have been good for the film. Gandalf arriving and opening the path for the sun, the trolls turning to stone, Thorne and Gandalf's dialogue, and the troll horde, this is done good as well. This is done well as well. I like how they altered how Sting is found, which foreshadows Bilbo's decision later. They cut to this earlier, and here is when they bring it into the main story. The Necromancer plotline I know does seem forced at, at, at times, but the more I've watched these films, I think it works. I know what was going on, and I know at this point Gandalf had been to Dol Guldur at least once, and yes, they changed this. But I love the mysterious and dark background things in Middle-earth, and they visualize this quite well. Also, I think the characterization of Radagast the Brown was done great as well, as the nature-loving hermit, but also as the powerful wizard in his own way. The Rivendell scene brings to the table something they took a bit too far in these films, the dwarves and the elves' relationship. They did dislike each other, but I don't think enough to draw swords at one another. Hugo Weaving is back as Elrond Half-Elven, and the portrayal of him as the learned lord is fantastic. The scene of the dwarves making fun of the elves felt so forced, and they didn't have to show it. Also, well, all they had to show was Elrond, Gandalf, and Thorin discussing the elven swords, and the dwarves' quest. The moon rune scene is good, and I don't mind them having white council members in these films. As it furthers along the necromancer plotline and the larger threat going on in Middle Earth, the dwarves and Bilbo continuing their journey is one of fantastic visuals and music once again. The stone giant scene, though visually cool, it did not have to be in here. I would have rather them just reference them and us hearing them in the background. The brief chat that Bilbo has with Bofur and the way they get brought into the Goblin Town works well though. Now let's talk about the Goblin Town sequence. I know there's a lot of torches here, but the entire environment seems a bit too well lit, and I think it would have looked much better if it was darker and more dim. I think the goblins were a bit too small and com comical looking. We've already seen how goblins look in these films, and being aesthetically faithful I think would have been better. The Great Goblin is fine, and I know that the creative team had fun with his design, but again, he's used for far too many jokes. Gandalf's re-emergence was done well, and their entire escape, though it 
did feel unnecessarily long is still very entertaining, and seeing the different ways the dwarves fight and work together is a great addition. The Riddles in the Dark sequence is done the best way it could have been done on screen. Andy Serkis is able to bring us back into his performance as the creature Gollum, as well as having great interactions with Freeman as Bilbo. The creature and the Hobbit have their game of riddles, with the former turning on the latter after he realizes that he has taken the ring. The scene where Bilbo chooses not to kill Gollum is a scene that is important in the book and they knew it had to be important in the films. Howard Shore brings us back well, brings back his score from the Fellowship to communicate the pity that our Hobbit takes on this miserable creature. Bilbo escapes and sees Gollum's hate for Baggins. The next scene did not go the way it did in the book, but I love how it's done here. Thorin has always doubted Bilbo up until this point. Who wouldn't have, right? And, but Bilbo figured this out, and he admits that he has been thinking of his home, of where he belongs. Thorin hasn't had that for a long time, and it, is, it was taken from him. Bilbo has come to understand this, and he wants to try and help Thorin get these things back. This is what the Hobbit should have been predominantly focused on. The relationships between the characters and how they change, more so than the grand battles. Now it's time to address the elephant in the room, Azog the Defiler. Though a canon character who is depicted perfectly in these films, and was a part of the Dwarves of Erebor's backstory, he already has been killed at this point in the story. Having him and Thorin have a grudge adds yet another plotline to the story and does get to the point where it drives the story more than the quest itself. If they were going to have a prominent orc character, which I like the idea of doing that, they should have gone with Bolg, son of Azog, since he is canonically alive at this point. But anyhow, out of the frying pan into, and into the fire, we finally get to see Peter Jackson's wards at their best, and they look amazing. After the company climbs up the pine trees, Gandalf uses his magic to light the pine cones on fire to use his projectiles against the massive wolves. The only way this sequence could have been cooler is if they had different colors of fire, but the sequence still looks good the way it is. The whole bit where Thorin arrogantly charges Azog and gets crushed was way too much and was quite dumb looking back. What exactly was his plan? The only reason they had this was because they wanted to have Bilbo save Thorin, but this was unnecessary. And I don't like Thorin and Bilbo's moment at the end of this film. They should have waited till later to do this type of scene. So the eagles take the company to the Karak, which is designed to look like a bear. Isn't that clever? The final shot, once again, wise, wisely only teases the reveal of Smaug, who we'll see in the next film. An unexpected journey gets what it needed to get right, right. Our main characters are all brought to life by great performances from the cast. Yes, the side plots can weigh the film down at certain points. Yes, the tone can feel inconsistent. And yes, there were some things that I would have done differently. But I think the good far outweighs the bad. Of these three films, this one is the most like what The Hobbit should have been overall. An Unexpected Journey is still an epic action and adventure film that is so much fun to watch that I will give an 8.5 out of 10. With that, folks, thank you all so much for joining me today. And please remember to leave a like comment down below and subscribe for more content about movies. That's all for now and I will see you all next time.